so welcome everybody. We've got a really awesome webinar for you guys today. Uh, we've got a little bit of a, a role reversal. Raleigh's going to introduce Scott because he's down there with him in Costa Rica. Uh, but this is going to be a jam-packed webinar. There's going to be a lot of information. You want to be really focused. So put your phone on airplane mode, close all those tabs in the background, just be here and present because Scott's really been doing this work. Uh, he's been making some beautiful stuff. And for people who are just joining us, um, so we are Water Stories. And what we are is we're a community dedicated to water cycle restoration. And I want to just show we've got, if for folks who have also been with us for a long time, we just opened up this new stories page on our website where we've got all of our films, stories, animations, all much easier to access and share with others than they've ever been in the past. Uh, you can sort through, you know, if you want to find our webinars, animations, videos. Uh, so I'm going to drop this in the chat, but really feel free to share this page with others. Um, also, for folks that don't know, we have a course to help train people to become water cycle restoration practitioners, whether it's a professional, steward, or advocate. Uh, so if you haven't already, I really recommend that you join us in the community at Water Stories, but more importantly, share those stories. There are so many amazing examples of humans creating positive interactions with landscape. Uh, and this is one of the stories that we have to share with you guys today. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it over to Raleigh uh, to introduce our guest for today's webinar. All right. Thanks for all the context, Zach. So I have the pleasure of introducing Scott Gallant today. We all had the good fortune of meeting Scott almost 10 years ago. We, we went to a place called Versaland where Scott was working with Grant Schultz setting up agroforestry in Iowa City in this big uh, desert of corn and soy. And here was this oasis where they were planting tens of thousands of mixed uh you know, fruits and fodder trees. And, and it was really amazing to see it all amongst this monoculture of, of nothing. And Scott's journey has been really amazing how he, he started off in the States. He's, then he transitioned into living full-time in Costa Rica, helping set up agroforestry systems with Rancho Mostatal and teaching PVCs. Eventually he set up his own business called Povenir Design, where he's been designing and creating amazing centropic agriculture systems all across Costa Rica and around uh, Latin America. I had the good fortune of going to Finca Luna and I was blown away seeing the systems that he created and how fast these places have been growing and the amount of complexity. And it's really beautiful. You know, there's places on earth you see and you're blown away, like the Kremiderhof, going to some of the systems that Scott set up, it was like seeing almost a tropical version of a Kermiterhof where the diversity really blows your mind and you see the potential of what can, it can create. And this, um, this kind of design brilliance really uh, shows in the work of, of Scott and of Povenir Design. And that's why it's really great to bring him on today to share his experience and his case studies of what he's been doing with Povenir Design, what he's been doing with Centropic Agriculture, and some of his thoughts on water. So we're going to wind those together today. And he's got an awesome course coming up for PDC in Costa Rica for people who are interested, which we're going to share after the presentation. So Scott, it's a pleasure having you on and stoked to see what you got to present to us today. Amazing. Yeah, great to be here, Raleigh and Zach. Thank you guys for um, yeah, offering up the space to share a bit of our work. And um, yeah, I think we'll dive in. Should I go ahead and share my screen? Yeah, go for it. All right, let's see that. Nice. Beautiful. So perfect. Um, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit first. Um, yeah, my name's Scott Gallant. I'm from the United States, from Ohio, um, but I've been here in Latin America and mostly Costa Rica for the last 14 years, so um, almost 15 years now. And like Raleigh said, I, I started off really working at an education center, diving into permaculture, design, kind of small scale systems, um, more maybe of a homestead focus. But in the last five or six years, I founded my business with my business partner, Sam Kenworthy, where he lives over by Raleigh, actually. Uh, our business is called Porter Vineyard Design. And 
we're focused on whole systems design, really whole site design. And often within that whole site design, we, we end up coming to the conclusion that how we want to grow food is through centropic farming. And so what I want to do today is try to connect a couple dots. Um, how, how does centropic farming relate to permaculture? How does it relate to water? And really dive into, okay, what is this idea of centropic farming? We'll, we'll look at some of the key principles, the design considerations, and key concepts. There are lots of farms kind of starting to get into this um, here in Latin America in particular, but we're seeing a lot of stuff happening in the Mediterranean, in Australia, New Zealand, and it's, it's really something taking off around the world, which is interesting to be part of that. And yeah, just excited to share everything. Uh, I'm really excited for the questions at the end. So please like start accumulating those and we'll get a chance to dive in and hopefully answer everybody's questions. So what is the relationship between permaculture design and centropic farming? What I wanted to peek at here was, yeah, like how we can consider these things together. In our professional work, when we're looking at a site, we usually have kind of three spheres of influence. Um, one is just like our basic site analysis. This is our observation of the land. We're trying to understand its history. We're trying to understand ecological processes. We're trying to understand, you know, current vegetation, human use, basically this endless conversation. We end up focusing in on a few things that I've circled here one of our primary focuses is always like, how do we create more zone five, which in a really simple way we could say would be more forests, like more wild spaces. And we're often doing that by understanding the topography of the landscape, which really starts informing both access and water. And I've highlighted water here. I've highlighted centropic farming for the obvious reasons. In this whole site analysis, we're, we're piecing together the future of perhaps a farm, here in Costa Rica, our work often might be more related to a hotel with a farm component, um, a retreat center with edible landscaping. Um, we work a lot with developments that have farm components in the center of what might be a residential experience. So that's kind of our site analysis. Our design process is really putting that all together. It's the formation of relationships. This is like the key work of permaculture design. Um, so this is, okay, understanding how we're gonna manage water, where are people gonna go, where are vehicles gonna go through access and where might we finally site like our zone one, our, our final home, the, the heart, the center of this work. The third piece that's gonna close this up is understanding our holistic context. This has a lot of different languages. We might call this different things, but it's basically the purpose. Like, why are we here? What are we trying to accomplish? Things that come out of this might be a list of physical elements. We want a natural swimming pool on the site. We want a garden. We want chickens, these very kind of classic permaculture elements. And then we're often going to get a set of objectives. And for our client work, almost always people are interested in growing food. That's on a really basic level, achieving some sort of self or community resiliency and disconnecting from the global food chain and all of that's it's horrible political, economic, environmental implications. And that's where we get to centropic farming. At its basic level, it's another methodology for growing food. Um, and so it's more comparable in my mind to something like biodynamic farming, something like John Jevons biointensive farming, more comparable to silvopasture. It is a method for growing food and it has a big focus, like a lot of methodologies within kind of the broader permaculture sphere of a focus on a perennial landscape, a perennial agroecosystem. So that I hope couches a bit of how, how these concepts work together and fit together. All right, let's see, we're gonna close out of drawing. I'm still learning how this works. There we go, there's my little turn off button, all right. We're going to erase these things. Beautiful. Okay, so 
what is syntropic farming? Syntropic farming is an agricultural methodology developed by Ernst Gosch. He was an agronomist from Sweden who ended up in Brazil. He spent a little time here in Costa Rica, but he ended up in Brazil and purchased a really degraded piece of land in Bahia, um, kind of coastal central Brazil, very tropical area. And he set out to, to determine like, how do you grow food while simultaneously reforesting the landscape. And so there's this big context of Brazil that we have to take into consideration for understanding the history of this methodology. Brazil is this heavily deforested state. Uh, the scale of agriculture there is massive. It's one of the largest you know, farming countries in the world compared to Costa Rica here, everything's small. We, there is export industry here, but it's, it's minuscule compared to just the state of Bahia. I don't know how many Costa Ricans would fit within that state alone, but it would be a lot. And so what I've come to understand from centropic farming is that in many ways, it is a response to this moment in Brazil's time where deforestation was just horrendous. And as, as Ernst Gosch was, was studying this, was studying his farming, these trial plots that he was putting on, he had a couple kind of aha moments. And, and these are things we'll see are, we'll find in different agricultural methodologies different around the world. These patterns repeat these kind of aha moments. And so he came up really with the idea of syntropic farming and the idea of the, the word of syntropy as a response to entropic systems. And so entropy is the idea that on a systems level, we really think of like our entire planet, our entire universe, from a really long perspective, energy is dissipating, uh, complex systems are breaking apart into smaller and smaller holes. But what we find is in, on our planet Earth, in biological systems, the opposite happens. There's actually this tendency to accumulate energy. We get these storages of energy that allow systems to complexify over time. It's much like all of Zach's and the water stories folks work with water. You change the topography, water starts accumulating and life starts forming there. And so we have found the same idea applied to agriculture. At a really basic level, centropic farming is what we'd call a successional agriculture or a process-based agriculture. So process-based would be the opposite of an input-based agriculture. This is going to be any green revolution, conventional agriculture that uses external inputs, fertilizers, um, uh, pesticides, fungicides, et cetera, um, whether conventional, whether organic, et cetera. Most of that agriculture is more akin to mining, as we often say. And so you're purchasing something from afar and you're bringing it into your property. In comparison, what we're trying to do here is work with ecological processes. And our main ecological process that we're working with is succession. And so if you think back to like, I don't know, high school biology class and the idea of ecological succession, this is the tree falls in the forest new plants start emerging and over time that system complexifies and becomes a secondary forest and eventually becomes a climax or mature forest again. And we're, it's often thought of as a very linear thing, but it's very cyclical. And essentially what we're trying to do in syntropic farming is leverage that process. We're trying to work with it in a very precise and detailed manner. I wanted to, to have a comment on how does centropic farming work with water? Um, we'll tie this in throughout the conversation. We'll really look at a case study at the end where we started doing a lot of terraforming within a centropic system, the implications of that, what we do different, et cetera. In general, I find that centropic farming takes a very agricultural approach to water. Um, our goals are to reduce inputs, reduce water demand. And so we're designing systems that are going to deliberately reduce evaporation. They're going to hold more water in the soil. We're working with a high diversity of plants from different families. So we have a lot of mycorrhizal relationships, which we know really 
helps impact that immediate water cycle. So in general, it's a focus on biology. I find a weakness in the methodology. I don't find that it really ever considers changing the, the topography of the soil, whether through terracene, um, through uh, different earthwork swales, et cetera. That's often because the methodology is applied to more agricultural land that's already quite flat. This isn't always the case. Um, I find that there's not a lot of consideration for source of water. Um, if your irrigation water, if you need irrigation water, is that coming from a well, rainwater, a spring? Um, I haven't found many conversations in that. And then I think the biggest weakness is that I don't see it talking about the larger context. I don't see it talking about like watershed, regional hydrological cycles. And I, I share this, this is a, I don't know, constructive criticism, because I know so many people here are interested in water and we're always looking for ways to strengthen these relationships. And so it feels like there's a niche there for people to plug in to support this type of work where there's things that aren't happening so much. So I hope that makes sense. All right, let's see where we're at. All right, so we're gonna dive in to, this will be a mix of kind of case studies while presenting key concepts as we go. Um, I will be looking at two farms in particular that our team's been working with for a number of years. One of those is called Tierra Mor. It's located in the dry tropics of Guanacaste. And the farm manager there, his name is uh, Javier. And I really want to emphasize the credit that all of our farm managers that kind of we collaborate with on projects. So they're the ones every day. They're doing a lot of the detailed design work, a lot of the installation. And just want to emphasize that there's a lot of people behind this. This isn't our team coming in and doing this and walking away. Um, the other project we'll be looking at that um, Raleigh was able to visit us at it was Finca Luna Nueva. The farm manager there, Gerardo Calderon, is, is amazing. He's taken a couple courses now, and we we're able to take a course in Mexico together. So we're looking at those two projects. So in syntropic farming, we have three main tools that we're going to use. Sometimes these are called principles. We have what will be called our consortium. We have what's our life cycle, which also sometimes is just called succession. We have stratification. You look at the image in the background here with the contour map, we're going to see over the next few images how this space slowly transformed over time. And these are things we can come back to in the Q&A to see what um, we want to dive into maybe a little bit deeper. Okay, so a consortium. The consortium is the complete group of plants that we're going to plant together in a space over space and time. So there's a lot of considerations for spatial and temporal relationships. A key concept in syntropic farming is the idea of clearing to clearing. So from a forest that gets opened up, and it slowly becomes bigger and larger until you get giant forest trees and then those get removed again. Maybe that's through a natural process, a hurricane comes in, or maybe that's through design in a timber plantation. And then we're starting again. And so we're always thinking from a timeline perspective, really long-term clearing to clearing and anticipating that that next clearing, we will have even more abundance. There will be more soil um, the, the water holding capacity of the land will be greater. We'll be able to activate the next round of this system faster. And this cycle might be a, a 30 year cycle. That, that's something we would often consider in our designs. And so what this consortium is, it's often communicated in this simple grid on our X axis. So the up and down, we see what's called the strata. And so this is kind of the height of plants more complex than that, we'll touch upon it. On the y-axis, we see how these plants change over time, so life cycle. And then each box in this, you can basically consider as an ecological niche. And so we want a plant to fill every ecological niche in time and space in these systems. So when we're designing this, we're thinking about, you know, what do we want to grow? Um, is this a market crop? Is this a crop that, you know, are we just growing things for our own consumption? 
And then what plants are gonna support those plants? A really interesting feature is that every plant you see on here, and I don't know, maybe there's 20 different species. Every one of those gets planted at the same time, right at the beginning of the system, right at the start of the first clearing. And so they all grow up together. And one of the foundational ideas behind some triple farming is that we're gonna be getting a yield from say day 30 until year 30. And this comes back to a lot of the context of Brazil of reforestation of where, like how do you convince, how do you possibly convince farmers to invest in reforestation, invest in long-term tree crops, cacao, pejibaye, ojoche are, are kind of our principal tree crops in here without them being able to get a yield, revenue, food in those first five, six, seven years. And so centropic farming is a solution to that, a methodology that, that seeks to clarify that. And so looking at all the plants here, what we would find is that our beans are going to produce within 90 days. Our squash is going to be within six months. Um, the cassava within nine months, the corn within nine months. And then we start getting down into the secondary things that take a little bit longer. Taro is going to take maybe 12 months, pineapple, 18 months. Moringa might be two years before we harvest. And we get a little further. The bananas and plantains, maybe two years. Cacao, three years. Pehibaye, five years. Ahoche, 10 years. And we start having these cyclical harvest coming in over time. So the consortium is like, it's like the vehicle that everything fits within our whole planting arrangement. And then that travels together and all these plants with it. Life cycle. This is organizing plants over time. This is the amount of time a plant will exist within a system. And so a corn plant, we're planting it at day one, maybe we're harvesting it in three months and within four months, it's removed from the system. It's fulfilled its ecological niche. It has contributed to the root mingling. It's caught, created shade. It's stock and the cob are now biomass and it's created the microclimate for the next round of plants. We are usually removing plants either by pruning them, like with like pruning a tree in like a coppice strategy or by harvesting them out of the system. The life cycle is often broken down into placenta one, placenta two, secondary and climax. Placenta one can be from zero to six months. Placenta two would be things that are still in the system up to 12 months. Secondary would be from one year to 15 years. Climax would be everything beyond 15 years. These are very flexible categories. Sometimes you see secondary one, secondary two. You can really play with those things over time but the main purpose is understanding where the plants are going to work, what they fit within that system and how long they will be within the system before you're either harvesting or you're pruning them. So this is life cycle. If we look at the image there, you can see kind of the first chopping of this space. You can see as well for those of us thinking about water, the erosion, the sloughing, there's an old road along this space that we're, we're starting to fix up. Um, some of that work's happening this year. So let's go to the last of these big three. Okay, stratification. This is sometimes the most confusing one. This is organizing plants in space. Um, this is the relationship of, what should say light requirements as life, the relationship of light requirements and height of the plant. But it's really about the amount of sunlight the plant needs. It's not about that's a huge tree it needs or it's a low plant. It doesn't relate to that so much. I'll give an example. A lettuce. A lettuce is, you know, what? It's going to get up to six inches tall. 
very short plant, but it requires near full sun. In this case, a lettuce would be in the high strata. It can have a little bit of shade over top of it, but not very much shade. So even though it's a short plant by like physical stature, its sunlight requirements are really high. And so we need to classify the plants by strata. And we often talk about five stratas, having ground cover, low, medium, high, and emergent. Just like, just like the life cycles, the strata within these categories, you're gonna find specific characteristics. So for example, placenta one plants are almost always herbs, grasses. There are a lot of things that we, we consume, vegetables. Here in strata, for example, a lot of emergent plants are things that grow really tall and thin. Think of corn, um, pigeon peas, a classic one here. They're often spindly. They can break really easily. In their ecological context, they're plants that would grow up and really thin, really quick, grab that little niche of light. And then in a disturbance event, they might break and snap and now open up space for something below them. These images, we can see the ground preparation for a centropic farming plot. So on the left, right after the soil was first tilled, we'll be talking later about disturbance, these one-time disturbances and how those fit into our management. And then on the right image, you can see these fields after their first planting. So a bit more in strata, um, a couple images that I pulled from well-known practitioners. I really like the work of Scott Hall, who's based in Australia, and then the folks of Life and Syntropy, Diana and Felipe are excellent. When we talk about strata, we also often talk about percentage of cover. And so we can see on the chart on the left, low plants should occupy up to 80% of that strata. And so if you were to take like a cross section, like cut those plants out and look at them from above and see how much sunlight filters through, only 20% would filter through. And so what this means is that our emergent layer, we are generally striving for 20% cover. That means when we go to design a system and we're planting maybe our long-term climax emergent trees, maybe in a hectare, we could only fit in 10 of those trees, for example, so that we're not having the emergent trees cover the entire canopy. These percentages change over time. They depends where we are in the life cycle of the system. They change as we manage the system, as we prune it. But this is a good rule of thumb when we're selecting plants, we think about the quantity of plants we want. There's another little image here that I think has a nice, Let's see, I'm going to draw on it. It has a nice little, little thing for us because we can see that there's kind of a gap here and here, here and here, here and here. What we end up getting is we're trying to get some space between these canopies. This is a detail that we'll see examples of later, but we're really trying not to have too much physical touching between the different strata of plants. We'll organize them differently to achieve that. But it's a good example and again, shows how these percentages might play across the site. Let's erase, erase. All right, let's see where we're at. So again, consortium is like this whole ecosystem of plants that we organize together. We organize by life cycle, which is a, this, the temporal relationship and basically plants roll in succession. And then we organize by strata, the light requirements of plants and how they'll physically stack on top of each other. Within that, and sometimes both density and diversity are, are considered principles of syntropic farming, I think there's still some work to be done to define, to come up with a more uh, cohesive language. But we 
plant highly dense systems. Within a square meter, we might have up to 40 different plants from a number of different plant families, many different species. We often talk about if you're missing a species in the strata, your organization of strata, what happens? Well, you get weeds, whatever that word means, but we'll just use it in its, I don't know, the, the colloquial nature of it. I think we understand that it's not a great word, but you get these plants you don't want that will come up and fill that niche for you that's missing. And then we're striving for diversity and the diversity is really like, I've heard it called how we achieve like the immunological system within this complete consortium, this complete system, having this great diversity of plants. And what we find is that if we're missing a species in this life cycle arrangement, what happens? We start finding more pests and diseases within our system. One of the things I've really enjoyed studying syntropic farming is it relates a lot to some of the best soil science work coming out from Dr. Christine Jones. For people, if you're not familiar, you should be familiar. And she speaks a lot about the necessity of having at least four distinct plant families working together within a plot. And the benefits, the collaboration one gets from the different roots within that system. And so there's a lot of overlap here between this, the top soil work that's coming out, the water work that people like Zach and others are doing. And, and we really like playing within all those different ecosystems. Uh, we could go back. This was, let's see it, here we are. This is that first field we were looking at. Um, probably six months after planting. And we'll just look at a couple of the key design principles. Uh, again, I don't know if the word principle is the right word, but considerations. Okay, we mentioned high density. It's hard to give enough emphasis to how dense we will plant things in centropic systems. When I first took a course, I was shocked. Sometimes when we're designing these and we're installing them, the crews we're working with are shocked. We will literally put up to 40 plants within a square meter. I've seen things where you have a timber tree and six inches away from the timber tree is an avocado and six inches away from that avocado is a cacao and six inches away from that is a tomato and six inches away from that is a banana. And it's all extremely dense. And we're really striving for that density to make sure the soil is always covered with living plants above the ground, diverse roots below the ground, that water's being retained. We're trying to create shade, especially here in the tropics, especially in the dry tropics where this project is. Like right now, things are windy and dusty up there. So we're, there's an extreme density here that surprises people. If you are unsure, we we'll always say plant more, plant more things. One of the other key design elements is the spatial arrangements of plants. And so we have these different rows. You can see that most of these systems are linear. Sometimes they're curvilinear. But we'll be putting different plants based on their strata, their life cycle within different rows to achieve desired results. We'll see examples of that. And then the other main consideration is row orientation. The we're orienting our rows in general from north to south. And we're doing that to maximize photosynthesis. And an interesting consideration, and I'd be really curious to hear Zach's thoughts on this. In Centropic, we're often ignoring contour for planting. I've seen rows oriented up and down very steep slopes before. And there's implications of that. There's the the risk of erosion is much greater. The counterpoint is that if this is done right, our soil is covered and we're taking care of that. So we'll look at some of the designs of these areas. So this was designed in a course we did last year. We collaborated with our friends Colectivo Y Bill who are out of Mexico and Costa Rica. And this shows the 
different layout patterns. We wanted to trial two different layout patterns. One is basically going up and down the slope and one is across the slope. And we wanted to see what the implications were as we go and expand this system into the future. And so I'll go back a couple of slides so you can see this. And so you can see those patterns, everything that was, you can see planted, we finished in the course, and then we have a course coming up in June, we'll finish this upper part. But you can see the, the area, let's see, let's go ahead and draw that on. The area here, this guy, I can make it bigger maybe. Here, that is going up and down the slope, but it's much closer to north and south. And so in theory, we're gonna get more photosynthetic potential, greater efficiency in that space. I think there's still quite a bit of debate in the centropic world. There's people that have a lot of confidence and say, no, it should be like this, it should be like that. I think it's very site specific with the overarching theme of how do we maximize photosynthesis? So we'll come back. And then let's look here. Within that field plot you were seeing, this is the amount of plants that are in there. And so I will zoom in. I think you guys can see when I do that. And this is a simple planting sheet. It's pretty common in centropic farming that you do a lot of work on Microsoft Excel, laying all of this out. But we can look and you can see placenta one, placenta two, intermediate, that's another word for secondary. And then within each of those, we'll find different strata. So if you look at placenta two, you'll see emergent plants like papaya, moringa, castor bean. You'll see medium plants, ginger, turmeric, taro, et cetera. And so we're really densely planting this and trying to fill all of the different ecological needs within it. And then we start getting these interesting plant layout patterns. And so these lines are principal tree lines and we have different strata within them. And so in these two lines, we have high and low strata. There's four meters distance between those lines. And over here we have emergent and medium. What that means is we're reducing competition between these lines on, on a, a spatial level. So if we have, we call this like line A, which is a common parlance, and we call this line B, if I sketch line A over here, it's going to be an emergent plant that's going to come really up high here. And then it's going to be a medium plant that's going to be kind of in between. Well, four meters over here, we have a high plant and we have a low plant. And so the idea is that we get these strata lines coming across and the plants are not directly competing with each other. That's a horrible artwork, I apologize. But I think you understand. Let's erase these things. This is the basic way we go about designing these systems. You know, there's a piece where we're understanding what we're trying to plant, what we're trying to accomplish, what's the goal. And we start building out these spreadsheets based on the consortium that we want and then the context of the site, et cetera. So let's see where we're at. All right, so we're gonna just run through a bunch of key concepts here and what I would consider to be ideas that are unique to syntropic farming. There's lots of things that are not. Tree rows with grass in between, that's silvopasture. Tree rows with taro growing in between, you know, that's an alley cropping method that's been around for a long time. So, but what is unique? Okay, here's some examples. We really like the use of C4 grasses. Here in the tropics, we love our Mombasa grass. It's a panisum grass, and you can see the rows of them here. This is an improved pasture grass. It handles a bit of shade, so it can really last through the secondary years of the system. And you can see here, it's planted along the edge of the tree rows. We have our tree rows here. 
that's a really common thing to use. We see it a lot in Brazil, and we're starting to use a lot more here in Costa Rica. Um, for a lot of practitioners, combining this grass that can be very aggressive, it can seed, it can travel, it could kind of take over a system, is really hard for people that are used to planting trees that are thinking about how to reforest degraded pasture land. That's a, that's a tough sell for people. And so we have to do this really well. We have to plant this in a really orderly manner and we have to understand how often we're gonna have to go in and manage it. But our C4 grasses produce so much biomass, they do so much photosynthesis that they really jumpstart these systems. It's really an impressive tool, I'm completely convinced. The other piece that's interesting within these systems is the combination of trees with horticulture. So I said early on, we're trying to get a yield at day 30 to year 30. And so we're often combining this tree rows that you can see with annual crops. Sometimes those annual crops are just on the edge, kind of right by where this Mombasa grass would be. But sometimes this entire alleyway is gonna be designated for annual crops. In this case, these are tubers. This is uh, yucca, sweet potato, and malanga. On the right, we see our tree row here in the center but then the alleys are actually rice. And then once the rice is out, this will move to the tubers and then eventually we'll actually be bringing chickens into this system, which we'll talk about animals shortly. What'll happen over time, and this is kind of interesting in this system where you can see me standing, right where I'm standing, eventually we'll put in another row of trees here. As these trees get bigger and bigger, and there's just not enough sunlight coming through, we'll come in and fill this in with coffee plants eventually. That could be 10 years from now. And the Mombasa grass lines, we might migrate those over here and replant them and we'll eliminate the annuals. And so we can play with this over time. So again, C4 grasses, the use in Centropic, I find to be really innovative and quite unique to these systems. And then, there's a real systematic way to try to combine annuals with these perennial agroecosystems. All right, another key concept, a bit of another thing that when I first saw, I felt a little shocked. There is a level of detail in organizing biomass in these systems that is unparalleled in my experience. Um, these are just two examples from Brazil. One is a small medicinal plant garden. The other is a cow farm where they were renovating, they were doing what we will call a synchronization. We'll talk about that in a bit. But we take a lot of time to make sure woody biomass is in contact with the soil, that leafy biomass greens are on top of that woody biomass. We're often putting woody biomass in the pads, especially in smaller scale systems where that becomes where you walk and eventually breaks down. And there's a lot of consideration that it's really the edge when we think about where, where weeds come into our system, where things we don't want, it's right usually on this edge here of the path and the planting beds. And so we're organizing a lot of biomass really intentionally here. We might import it at the beginning of a system. It's pretty common. And there's other ways we can grow it on site beforehand in what we call an accumulation system, which we'll also touch upon. But there's a lot of attention to detail in organizing this biomass. It's something that always impresses me. It's, sometimes it's hard to convince people to take the time to do, but it's a key feature we see within these systems. There's lots of different ways to do it, but in general, woody biomass is touching the soil, green materials on top, you're edging the bed. Sometimes if the rows are not on contour, but we're worried about water, we will arrange the biomass to be um, perpendicular to the flow of water. Right, let's keep moving. All right, we'll talk a little bit more about spatial arrangements of plants. Um, this is from, these pictures are from an amazing farm in Brazil called Fazenda Orofino. And we can start to see a little bit more of an issue with termites going, or sorry, termites, I saw a comment. <laughs> a little bit more of a mature system. 
And if we look at the photo on the right, what's happened in this alleyway here is the Mombasa grass that was planted here all got pruned down and you can see how well this soil is covered. There is no bare soil in that. That's a really nice sign. And so over here we have, looks like cacao, there's acai palm, jackfruit. This is like our tree row here. And then we have a row of grass and then we have a row of support species. There's another row of grass, another tree row. And so this is often how we're organizing these. If we look on the left, this is a little bit older, shadier system. There used to be Mombasa grass in here, but it's been shaded out. It's gone from the system. I think this is like a 12, maybe an eight year old system if I remember correctly. And so we have a tree row here and we have other tree rows here and here. Then this is biomass and biomass. And what's kind of cool, we can start to see how these things are playing with each other. And so down here, we have low plants. This is cacao, cacao. And now we start getting high and emergent plants. And there's a real common feature, and we'll see more pictures of this, but if you see the trunk of this tree here, see how there's no branches from here to here? We're just having biomass grown up here. And what we'll do eventually is we'll come in and we're gonna cut off this biomass. We're gonna take it, we'll place it on the ground around these rows, nicely organized. And then that's gonna allow this cacao and there's an acai palm down here. They're gonna really shoot up and start fulfilling this niche. And then we'll keep harvesting this as time goes on. And so you can see how we're often using plants that tend to be very columnular, that just grow up. And we take off a lot, like over here, you can maybe see these uh, horizontal branches starting to form. We remove a lot of things like that in these systems so that there's not interference from one row to another, especially within the first maybe 10 years of a system. So those are just some examples of the Again, the spatial arrangements we find within these plant ecosystems. We often represent these in maps. And so this is an example of a planting schematic we did. You can see where I mentioned the A, B rows. C rows in this case are for annual crops. And we're again, organizing different plants based on their strata and their life cycle within different rows. So they're not competing so directly because everything's so dense. And so this ended up many months later looking like this. This is Finca Luna Nueva. This is a 1.2 hectare cacao orchard um, that's starting to come in really nicely. Okay, here's a big one that I find to be really special to Centropic Farm. Um, what I will call the vertical pruning of biomass. So what happens as these systems become shadier, it's harder for that Mombasa grass and other biomass species to grow in that dense shade of these canopy trees, of the high trees. So where do we get the organic material that's gonna keep the soil covered? We get it from emergent and high biomass species. Centropic is pretty famous for using eucalyptus, which has been quite, is a very controversial species, but something that I think um, those of us that understand the difference between giant monoculture and agroecosystems aren't super worried about. So again, we see some characteristics here very common in syntropic farming. We see these trunks that don't have many horizontal branches. And then we find this little poof of biomass up here really way high above the other trees. And that's what we prune off. And so you can see on the far left, this is a eucalyptus regrowing after heavy pruning. And if we look at the, let's see, over here, we can see the horizon where they have the cacao, which is gonna be a low species. We have bananas, which are gonna be um, either medium or high, it depends. There's citrus in the background, usually a medium. And then we have eucalyptus, which is a high, or sorry, an emergent. 
these are things you study and then you forget all the, the details of it. I really like the central picture. You can see the detailed ways that we're trying to prune. We're trying to leave porquetas. We're trying to leave, um, uh, what would you call it? Like little ramification, like branching, like little forks. There's the word. And we're often leaving a little bit of regrowth or a little bit of existing leaves. So photosynthesis keeps happening. But you can imagine that as this has all gotten pruned up here, like how much sunlight has opened up for the cacao, the bananas, et cetera, below. And that is a cycle that we're playing with. We're doing this pruning at very specific moments. We'll touch upon that as we, as we keep moving through this slide. So vertical pruning of biomass, we're planting basically timber trees, fast growing, that we're gonna prune for organic material. And in some cases, we're still able to get timber from them in this process. So I've heard mixed results about that. All right, let's see where we're at. Okay, we can still see more examples of pruning. This is um, the image on the right is from Ernst Gosch's farm there in uh, Bahia. On the left, we're still at Fazenda Orofino, also in Bahia, Brazil. All right, so we get into some more complex ideas. This is around intervention, disturbance. When do we come into these systems? We're keeping an eye out for moments of senescence or senescence. And these are the moments when a plant, like an individual plant, is coming to the end of its life or is entering into fruiting and starting to put all of its energy into fl flowers and fruits. For many of these species that are maybe the support species, they're just here so that we can have more cacao or more avocados or more olives or more chestnuts, whatever the main thing we're trying to eat is or sell. These support species, we might not want to let them flower or fruit, or we might see that, you know, it's a thing that's in the system for three years and it's coming to the end of its life cycle. We really want to pay attention to that. And we're trying to remove or prune out or harvest that species before it comes to the end. Because what happens? It starts triggering through its root layer, communicating in all of the different mycorrhizal networks that we're slowly learning more about, starts communicating, hey, this is not a moment of vegetative growth. This is a moment for pause. This is a moment for fruit or we're dying. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to intervene in this system, this heavy pruning, so that we're almost constantly in a system of vegetative growth. And what we find is that there's this intense growth pulse after this pruning. Hopefully you've seen that before. You've pruned a plant, maybe worried you're gonna kill it, and it just shoots back with so much growth. You know, People talk about that with our own human hair, right? If you have to cut it so it comes back healthier than before. Like this is pretty proven over years of coppice agroforestry, of agroforestry in the tropics with living fences, um, with just shade grown coffee and cacao, these quite simple agroforestry systems. But from a management perspective, we're really looking at how we can intervene in these systems to avoid senescence and encourage these growth policies. This is our disturbance. Sometimes it's a really big thing, sometimes it's a very small thing but it's a key concept within syntropic farming. Okay, let's touch upon the use of animals in these systems. Um, this is, I would consider something that's not too established. Um, I hear things, there's a farm whose name I'm forgetting at the moment in New Zealand that seems to do a really nice job of running chickens through these systems. So it feels like a niche to be explored that we need more people exploring. Um, in this case, this is once again, one of our projects, Finca Luna Nueva. Um, we have a young agronomist, Tomas, who is our animal systems manager. He's done a great job. And we've co-designed this system and it's fairly straightforward. We see our, our tree rows here. These are 10 meters apart. And then in between these rows, we'll run animals. They're going through a few cycles beforehand. Um, this was all like what we call takota, like a maybe 10, 15 year regrowth forest. And what's happening 
in these spaces right now that you can see in it, we had a pretty good harvest. You can see bare patches, but this was all rice. And then after the rice, we moved through and we put beans in. But now what's going to happen is that these are going to become paddocks. We're still debating whether it'll be more of a tractor system, portable fencing, permanent fencing. And we'll be moving pigs through these systems. They'll spend one to three days, maybe up to a week in each paddock before rotating on to the next. And in this, we're bringing in the methodology of holistic management um, or voicin grazing, uh, intensive planned grazing has different names. The tree rows in this case, everything planted in these spaces is to produce food for pigs. It's very dense. There's all strata represented in each row because we have a lot of spacing between the rows. And the hope is that things will just fall or we can just pluck stuff off right when the pigs are there. And we'll see, it's a, it's a true experiment. Um, we haven't seen examples of this before. Um, so again, haven't seen too many uses of animals in syntropic cysteine, but I think this would be the basic way you would do it. It's like kind of a classic silvopasture pattern with tree rows, except in this case, the tree rows are following, are built around a complete consortium. Does that make sense? You guys can't respond, so. All right, let's see where we're at. We need to delete these things. Very cool. Okay, here's a fun concept just to touch upon, we talk about the macroorganism in syntropic plant. We talk about unconditional love. What does that mean? The macroorganism is the idea that we're managing a whole, a complete place. It could be considered your whole farm. It could be your bioregion. It could be your watershed. It could be just this plot of land that's fenced off. And the idea of this with the concept of unconditional love is that in those moments when we are aggressively removing plants, we're pruning trees aggressively. We're up with a chainsaw at five meters of elevation. These are heavy disturbances. For some people seeing this, it can be a shock to the system. It's like, oh, wow, like that tree's been growing for 10 years. I planted it from a seed. How am I going to cut off all of the leaves? And the idea is that we're working toward a greater whole and that by removing that one plant, we're pushing the whole consortium along its successional timeline. So that it arrives at this more mature, complex ecosystem that's filtering water, capturing sunlight, producing food, creating habitat, et cetera. And so we often hear about this concept. I just wanted to touch upon it. More or less, that's what we're talking about in syntropic farming, that there's this greater entity. And though we might be doing these heavy disturbances within that, they're all toward this desire to have this greater, vibrant, alive whole. Okay. All right, I think we're near the end, and then we'll look at a case study. 5% planting and 95% management. This is what you will hear if you dive into the world of syntropic farming. So all that planting, the thousands of plants you put in the ground is only 5%. Then we get into management. This is a, an agriculture that demands attention, observation, time, eyes to acres, et cetera. What are our main management activities? We talk about selective weeding. To go through one of these whole sites and weed everything out is nearly impossible. And so you're very specifically choosing your weeds. You're looking for plants that are going into senescence. You want to remove them before that happens. You're often removing vining, crawling plants that might strangle out what you've planted. You're removing those. And you're really trying to remove the plants like by the roots. You're leaving other plants in there. You have to move through this quick. You can't be in there making this perfect. Our other management work is heavy mulching. We're constantly trying to cover the soil. We're looking for places where there are, is bare soil and we're locating the mulch in those places. 
We're often replanting. We learn a year later, like, ooh, we're missing something. This system here, we realize that, hey, we actually have a niche of, you know, a long-term climax nut crop that gets really tall. We think we can fit 10 of these in here. It's like, okay, great. Let's replant those. Our management work is in our pruning that we've talked about. And then, of course, harvest. The end purpose of this whole thing is like, how do we get a productive system? One of the things that I think is very compelling about centropic farming is that it's being applied to large scale systems. Um, I don't find it that useful personally, thinking about like a small scale homestead and garden, there's principles that will overlap, but people are mechanizing these systems to, to a lot of success and doing so with serious investment. And so we're, we're finding in our projects, these systems are young, but in general, we're really happy with the results so far. In three years, we will find more information. I'll have more confidence saying what I like and don't like, et cetera. Another concept that I mentioned at the, early on is this idea of synchronization. This is a key concept where when we go in to do these disturbances, say we need to replant. We, we, um, in this picture on the left, there's horticulture happening in these in-between rows. So when it's time to replant the corn or the rice, what we wanna do is time that planting with a pruning of the whole system. So it sets everything back. It gives everything on an even field so that that growth pulse jumps and affects everything that's happening all at once. When we know we wanna harvest something, can we prune at that same time that we're removing things from the system? So we're constantly looking for moments to synchronize everything and tie these growth pulses into our work and hopefully tie them up into when we know, hey, the bananas are coming in, the pineapple's coming in, let's get a growth pulse to them a month before the final harvest. These are things we consider. So just a quick review of these key concepts and we'll look at a case study really quickly. Consortium, the group of plants all together that moves through time to reach this higher successional level. Life cycle is our temporal relationship between plants. This is natural succession. Strata is the spatial relationship between plants, mostly based on light requirements, okay? There's all these other concepts we touched upon, but this is our building block for selecting our plants and organizing them together. Um, this graphic is, is a brilliant thing. It comes from the Life in Centropy project. It shows both our life cycle, placenta, secondary climax. It shows on the left, the strata. Here they use forest floor, undergrowth, different language. Plants filling all of those niches. There's an interesting thing I'll just give a quick emphasis to. You guys can find this and look at it. Over here, it says accumulation system and over here, abundance system. What this means is that this line down the middle here, everything to the left of that is not food producing. There's an assumption that we're in such a degraded land, like beat up farmland, that we cannot go in and plant peaches or sugar apple or cashews, they, they, they will not thrive in that. You would have to give them so many inputs so that they would thrive, which is how it's normally done. But actually we need to go through a whole accumulation system, accumulating nutrients, accumulating water, accumulating um, the soil food web life. And all of these plants in this whole consortium here are just accumulation so that then we can come in at this line, enter into an abundance and we do a huge disturbance again and we plant out all of these plants. And this is how we would take a site from zero and move it into a productive site. And that might take a year, two years, three years, but if we're really interested in a process-based agriculture that is no or minimal inputs, this might be the approach we have to take. It might require that level of patience.
So I love this graphic. There's a lot more stuff in here that you guys can explore. Um, you can see these curves at the bottom. Those refer to the senescence and the growth pulses and trying to intervene to maintain this track of vegetative growth. So it's always building upward and we don't drop back down. It's like the S curve in grass growth that we talk about in holistic management a lot. All right, let's see where we're at. We'll just give a quick case study. This will tie into water a little bit and then we're gonna wrap up here and take questions. Um, again, this is TRL Moore. This is a project we've been working on for a few years. Zach actually introduced me to this project randomly enough. I just realized that. Um, a lot of this work has been done by Javier. I really wanna give emphasis to that. Amazing young farm manager, agronomist. There's many other people involved. Um, this was a degraded, Part was cattle pasture, part was grass being grown for silage, heavily eroded. There was like a single tree on this site. Um, there's a lot more context to it. We're gonna come out with a blog post soon documenting this. Um, you can see on the left, the initial design that we sketched out. And then you can see on the right, the first clearing of the land and some of the earthworks that happened. And so this is a site where we're really trying to combine water management centropic farming and animals. The row spacing here is designed for chickens to move through these, which might be happening within the next two or three months. Ojalá, hopefully. These, there's swales on contour that drop into these seasonal ponds that then overflow back into another swale that drop into a seasonal pond and slowly make their way down the site. Each of these four alleys has slightly different plant arrangements based on their microclimate, potential views, and a couple other factors. Um, this is the image. I think the image got flipped, so it's kind of in reverse, which is a little weird to me, but maybe you don't notice that. Shortly after the earthworks were done, and you can see the tree rows, the initial prep and mulching of the ground. Um, there's lots of things that would do different here. I think if I could go back in time, I might terrace this instead of doing the swales. Um, I heard Zach talk about, and I've come to appreciate this, how swales really interfere with access moving through this space. Um, we did leave pretty big headways so that a quad can move through here, pulling a chicken tractor or, or just portable fencing, bring compost to the birds, et cetera. Um, but this is the foundation of what we put in the ground that is slowly getting more and more advanced, more moving along the line of succession. This is what Javi put together in the initial design. And you can see in here different ways we, we, we create these consortiums to understand how many plants we'll need, how far apart they're gonna get spaced, et cetera. And this will all be available, of course, for you to check out. So you guys can explore this later, but I, I wanna get to Q&A more. Some more images. Um, this is in the middle of the, its first dry season. It was really interesting. The irrigation water we thought we'd have was much less than we have. All sorts of things happen. Um, but it was interesting to see different parts of the property or the site that did really well and thrived. There was um, an old, highly degraded road that came right through here. This was the original farm road. And everything near this, as it was super eroded, has really struggled to grow. It's really taken a lot of time to catch up to these kind of these upper corners here that do really well. Um, and so it's been interesting to just observe these little nuances in the land. This, the water system was designed, and I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but you can see all the built infrastructure up here there's a lot of impervious surface. Today, this whole kind of courtyard area is all planted and has additional water features. You might actually see that, but this is all designed to receive that. And it's much more water than it can handle um, at the moment, but slowly everything upslope is getting arranged for this. But you can see again, how we're trying to combine these different ideas together and create a really complex thing. Let's erase these. This is a recent, photo after a really aggressive pruning occurred, um, brought down a lot of the initial plants. And of course we did last year, 
And now these alleyways are getting prepped for tuber crops, grains, et cetera, before the chickens come into them. And this is more or less what it looks like. Well, this would have been a few months ago at the end of the rainy season, um, well, even longer. This would have been maybe a year ago, shoot. But we, we can see as we started putting these water bodies in on the right, um, this is all planted around those now. This is right after construction. And you can start seeing how they're connected. Now we're trying to get all of these pieces to interact together, which is a really fun challenge. Um, just, you know, just running chickens alone would, I think, make this hard, but bringing in the complexity of, of Centropic, the water management, et cetera, has been a, a really fun piece for us to play with. And yeah, I'm gonna wrap this up. We're a little over an hour, so I think that's probably perfect. Um, now there's a bunch of questions I'll mention really briefly. We have a couple courses coming up. We have a two-week permaculture design course with a focus on centropic farming. Uh, I'll be taught by myself um, and a, a number of our teammates. And then in June, we'll have a centropic farming course where I'll be teaching with Colectivo Y Bill. That course will be in Spanish, though we're kind of all bilingual. So um, it's really a hands-on course. The permaculture course is much more of a design focus. It's a very diverse um, introduction to all of these different topics, trying to form coherency between them, which is what our team focuses on a lot. So thank you guys for, yeah, taking the time to be here. I hope it was interesting. I know there's lots of questions. I'm around. And yeah, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Does that make sense to you, Raleigh? And Zach, yeah. let me know what you guys think. Yeah, that was great, Scott. And I, I can attest, like I got to attend a little, I think it was like a two-day workshop with you guys on tropic agriculture. And it was so much hands-on learning. It was fantastic being able to be out there and see your, walk every design you guys made, see a bunch of different sites um, and actually be able to plant and see your planting patterns. It was so eye-opening. It was incredible. It's and, you know, if, if you're just getting into us as a PDC, that this would be absolutely mind blowing. You know, like I did my PDC in New Zealand, but in a context where you're interested in this type of development system, this is probably one of the best ones you could find anywhere. And especially if you're anywhere near Latin America, really consider coming out uh, to Costa Rica for this PDC. And that's from the Tropic course later in June. Um, and... Following on that, Zach is going to introduce some, some of what we're doing at Water Stories for people who want to dive deeper into the water context. And so Zach's going to share a bit more about that, and then we'll go into Q&A. Awesome. And amazing presentation, Scott. Thanks so much for sharing all of this with everyone. Uh, there's a lot of inspiration and questions going on in the background. Folks, enter your questions in the Q&A. Um, and then also, if a few of you want to ask your questions live, you can raise your hand, um, especially people who've already put the question in the Q&A. If you want to ask your question live, raise your hand. Um, also, just to note, you guys might have mentioned this or I might have missed it, but they also do courses in Spanish. So your Spanish speaking friends. Uh, I just popped the workshop link again in the chat here. Share that with them. And then as Raleigh more. mentioned, we also have our upcoming core course uh, for Water Stories. This is going to start at the end of this month. Um, and I'll say, you know, in my opinion, these two things together are super powerful. We have a couple of students who have gone through the core course and do syntropic agriculture. And the two together, it's really like there's nothing you can't accomplish. I think Rajendra says it really well when you need to treat the water systems, but also treat the land areas. And if you only do one or the other, what you accomplish never goes as far as if you do the two together in, in synthesis. Um, so definitely recommend you guys check out Scott's workshop or workshops, check out our course. Um, it's only gonna be open till the end of March. Once we start, it won't open again until 2025. 
Um, and we're also going to include details for both of those uh, in the email that you guys will get after this with the replay. Um, so while people's questions are queuing up, I got one selfish question I want to ask you, Scott. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course. You touched on something that I think was really powerful in that, you know, as humans in this modern day and age, I think we struggle to connect with our landscape to begin with. And when we connect, it's usually on an individual basis, like this plant or this planting. And it's really hard to see the whole. And what really struck was when you're talking about, you know, this important phase of coming through and managing and pruning. And oftentimes, same with our water work, it's like this big destructive impact all at once right. that yeah. only makes sense when you can see the whole. And so I wonder when you're working with farm managers, with clients, how do you, how does that conversation go? How do you help them see the whole or what lessons have you, have you learned that can help others help their clients or their family members or whoever see that whole picture? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Like I immediately think this project Finca Luna, this last year we bought a rototiller, simple rototiller, like pretty basic tool, but it's a project that for years has been really opposed to tillage as a practice, you know, like and I, it, if people have argued that the, the till is like the most, like the, the tractor plow is the most destructive tool mankind's ever made. I think there's like a book about it, like the Plowman's Folly, I believe it's called. And like, we really had to convince him like, guys, we're going to make this disturbance, but it's going to allow so many things to happen afterwards. We're doing it once, like that a heavy one-time disturbance, or if you need to disturb more in the future, designing for that, planning for a machine to be able to go in so it can always go in without, you know, having to take out a bunch of trees. I, I think the biggest thing is understanding like why you're there, the purpose of these projects and becoming literate in some sort of methodology, holistic management, um, uh, I don't know, living design systems where you can really, especially with a client, you can help them articulate and understand why you're there. People, a lot of times what we'll find is they'll be really afraid just to take out like a single tree, especially early on in a project. It's like, you know, you've got this piece of land finally and you, you want to protect it, this overwhelming desire to protect it. And that tree, it might mean you can't put your garden there where it makes the most sense to put your garden. You're going to plant 500 trees just 50 meters to the right. And, and I think having the courage to, to, to do that can be hard for people that are really new to just being with a landscape, working with plants. And yeah, I, I think learning how to talk about these things, like on a professional level, articulate these ideas is the key for people. Um, facilitation skills are indispensable. And then if it's your own land, I think just watching it over time like you'll be worried about that tree, but you're going to see so many trees fall down just from the rainstorm, or, you know, or the neighbor, you know, causes erosion from his property and ends up on yours. And yeah, I think that's my, that's how I think about it. And some examples that we run into a lot. Yeah. Great answer. Yeah. That conversation is is super important. And it's one of the pieces where, you know, I think it's so important to uh, take courses with practitioners who can help you learn how to carry that conversation. Um, there's there's so many great courses out there, and I think they all really have something to offer. But if you can find people that are doing it for clients, they know how to have those conversations. They know how to navigate it. And even just tacitly, by attending that workshop, you're going to grab the words that help them carry that conversation to then help yourself carry that conversation. Um, so I have no doubt that, that that's certainly something we offer a lot in our course, and I'm sure you guys do as well. And honestly, that's oftentimes 
almost the bigger piece of doing the work. There's the techniques and the tools, but there's all the things around it that ultimately determine yeah. whether it's a success or not. 100%. Communication, you know, setting expectations like, yeah, for two months, this is going to look rough. Like, you're going to come into this orchard and be like, what on earth? Like, we when we went to Ernst Gosch's farm and did a tour, they had just done this really aggressive pruning. And it, it was, there weren't that many leaves in the space. And this is this 30 year old system. They were basically setting it back to a clearing. And even, you know, for me still, you see it, and you're like, mother, fuck, what can I, I can curse there, right? right. Um, it's like, wow, okay, I can be that aggressive. And, and maybe that's what's needed. And, and those are the things you have to have to play with. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Raleigh, do you have anything you want to bring up or should we dive right into the Oh man, questions? there's some there's some great questions here. Actually, I really like the one uh that yeah, that Barbara just posted. So, I mean, this is right on topic about how to convince people to do rainwater capture here in Costa Rica. Uh, <laughs> and we might, you know, like it was awesome seeing Sam's place. Probably one of the one there I may have not seen enough spaces, but Sam is one of the one people I've seen here in Manzanillo who's actually capturing rainwater and having tens of thousands of gallons of rainwater captured. Because a lot of people, they're just running out of water in this neighborhood and they have to rely on water trucks. Like here we're on my property, you're just like, sorry, we're going to run out of water and we have to truck in water and your water bill is going to go up to $500 a month because we didn't plan for any water capture. So anyway, getting back to the question, uh, this is from Barbara saying, as a permaculture designer working on two small farms here in the Zerkai area of Costa Rica, uh, how to convince people of the need to capture rainwater, retaining it in the soil and administering it locally rather than cause flooding as it overwhelms the city and countryside. Also rainwater caption for use during the dry season. Some people laugh since we have abundant rainfall most of the year, but in March and April, our water is rationed and turned off for part of the time. So yeah, what it, when you see that context, yeah, you know, how do you convince people to invest in water capture, rainwater capture? I I don't know if convincing people is ever going to be the most effective strategy. I think you have to show them. Mm -hmm. So a, a little bit of a change in language, but here in Costa Rica there's a legal piece here where you need what we call a water letter permit, like a proven source of water to build your house. Rainwater does not count for that. So a well can count public water, a spring can count, but rainwater does not count. So you have to have another source of water. And so rainwater at best feels like a backup and the cost of it can be prohibitive. You're here you're, it's basically the cost of storage, both the, the actual cost of like a tank, ferro cement, and then the cost of maintenance of store. Storing a thing requires some maintenance. I would approach it two ways. One, and I think you kind of mentioned both of these. One is just like dealing with impervious surfaces and the erosion that they cause. And that should be much easier where you have these roofs, you should be collaborating with, I don't know, if you're in the building phase with an architect, you have roads, all of these cause water to concentrate in certain areas. There's so many just little micro techniques that are out there, um, low tech erosion stuff that, where that water can be slowed, moved through the landscape with check dams, rock barriers, riprap, vetiver grass, and it's, destructive force can be minimized. I find people are usually really on board with that because you can usually see the results right away in that there's not erosion and the cost is usually pretty low. Rainwater capture for potable or irrigation off of a roof is harder to convince people here because of the cost. Um, I think we need more examples of it. I think if we had better numbers in regard to, hey, if you do this, it's going to cost you $5,000 to set up, but for the next five years, you're going to save double that money in your water bill. 
on a broader level, it's a law that needs to be changed. There should be a legal incentive, a political incentive for rainwater capture. That does not exist. I don't know how you change that here. Um, so it's a tricky thing, but I think better examples, and like Raleigh said, our, my business partner, Sam, He's one of the only people I know that are, are really taking that serious. And we're hoping that within a year, our team will have really good numbers. We'll be able to say, hey, this is the result in this climate. This is what it cost. No additional water was needed. Um, yeah, those are, those are my thoughts. There's very decentralized options. If you just need a little bit of water over here, for irrigation, it becomes simpler to set up a rain barrel to a roof and, you know, occasionally water a nursery throughout the dry season. But those don't, those aren't necessarily maybe the big changes you're referring to. Those are my thoughts to the question. Thoughts. Great response. If, if I can add just one layer to that, one piece that really struck me when I was down in Costa Rica is this, and this kind of speaks to, you know, bigger picture, how are we managing our rain on landscape? And I think if you want to help people understand the story there, get the elders to speak and listen to their stories. And, you know, with shifting baseline syndrome, we only know the last handful of years, and we assume it's always been that way. But when I was in Costa Rica giving a presentation, we got some of the elders to speak about what life was like there. And they described year-round springs that gave them ample water, landscapes full of fruit trees everywhere. I mean, it just breaks your heart what you hear, but you also understand that we can have healthy water resources in an area with a climate like Guanacaste, where it's really dry for six months. You know, the 60 and 70-year-olds remember when they had water without a well at all. Um, and so I think one of the ways especially when we talk about like community activation, just getting the old people to speak up and then listening to them is I think one of the best ways to convince others. Um, Cause you just, you can hear so clearly the trajectory and how something else is also possible, not only possible, but someone within their lifetime experienced it. Beautiful. Yeah. And, and here potentially it's like, Oh, if it went the other way, this area was like a dusty desert before. And actually the forest came back. It's, you know, I think that can go both ways, but mostly the here. Yeah. If it was better before, what could be again? Okay. Uh, I see there's another water question here. And then there's like some kind of combined questions. A lot of people asking about the context of labor about why, you know, is it affordable, more affordable in Latin America? Why is it tropic agriculture in the, you know, Northern Hemisphere? But Seth is asking a question, another one about water. He says, beginning work in the Mayan highlands of Guatemala where rainfall is no longer predictable. Farmers have never collected, stored, or distributed water. There's pressure to immigrate to cities. So in this context, how can centropic farming help? Can you, can you say that again? Okay, so he, it's uh, farmers have never collected, stored, and distributed water. There's pressure to emigrate to cities or other countries, so we're trying to help address farming challenges of this region. So the question is, how can centropic farming help under these circumstances? So areas where people had never even thought of water, but it's suddenly become a big challenge. How can centropic agriculture kind of help help folks in that kind of context? Yeah, I think it, it's it's really a powerful methodology for reducing the need for irrigation. And, and I think people have been finding this. The systems we're working with in Guanacaste are still young. We're usually irrigating. Or we anticipate irrigating for three years. We have a system that has no irrigation. We'll see how it does. It's total experiments. The first one I think I showed you guys. I think that you need a demonstration site is, is what I immediately think about. It's like, how can you show that this food can be grown with a minimal amount of water? Getting a demonstration site, it can be really simple, it can be small scale. There's a concept within syntropic farming called nests, like a bird nest um, that applies, I think, 
better to maybe less flat land or more smaller scale homestead backyard. You're basically having kind of a classic, sort of like a permaculture guild with this, the idea of the strata and the life cycle over time, you know, a central tree and all these support species around it. And so I think it depends a lot on in Guatemala, like, what are you trying to grow? Is this like tomatoes? Is this tea? Is it coffee? And then seeing examples of where that's been successfully grown in these other systems, this other methodology, and then trying to apply that where you are and, and finding out how it works for yourself. Nice. Well, I see, I see kind of two questions here and then we there should hop to some live ones because those are always fun. But uh, I think this is a pretty simpler one. Marius is asking, are there plant lists or somewhere for different climate soils and areas which simplify the planning? For example, a person in a desert and wants to do some tropic farming, where can he find the sources for that? So, you know, is there yeah. a list where you can find like, hey, this is a centropical agriculture context for tropical climate, dry climate, temperate, continental climate? Just yeah, there's sources. a lot of lists out there. Um, maybe I can share a few with you, Raleigh, and that can go, I don't know if you can link that somewhere, like later. Yeah. I'm not sure the best way to do that. Okay, yeah. yeah. We could include okay. that with the email or the replay. Perfect. So I can share some. There's a really good Facebook group. I think it's just called Centropic Agriculture, or Centropic Farming. There's also one for temperate climates that I'm not in. But if you go into the resource tab in that Facebook group, you'll start finding a lot of lists. Um, people are starting to put them together. I've never seen one that's like so incredibly comprehensive. Um, a lot are in Portuguese. It's one of the challenges of Centropic Farming, the less and less. Having a little bit of Portuguese in your life helps. And so they're out there. That Facebook group is probably the best resource. And then just Googling around and you start seeing where people have accumulated resources. But I've got a few that I'll share with Zach and Raleigh to, to link up. Cool. Okay, yeah, so another chat question here. So these are from folks in kind of uh, not just tropical cli uh, cli climates, they're saying, like, hey, this is, you know, of course, deeply labor intensive. Is there part of why these techniques are being applied in tropical areas uh, versus, you know, northern and southern regions? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I have the same doubt myself. And like there's farms really popping up all throughout Europe, um, both increasingly in northern Europe, a lot in southern Europe in Australia, New Zealand, where the cost of labor is extremely high. So it's happening. Um, it's interesting to think about how the management changes, but it's a good question. I don't have a good answer for it. It feels, what I can say is, I've spent time in Brazil a little bit and then here in Costa Rica and the cost of labor in Costa Rica, is, it's higher than Brazil. And it did feel at times when I was there that like, boy, these guys can just throw labor at this site in a way that we couldn't ever dream of just here in Costa Rica where the cost is a little bit higher. Yeah, so it's a good question. I don't have a great answer for it. I hope to visit more farms in Europe this summer um, and get a bit more tuned into that. If I can throw in there something too, I'll say from, and this is very much site dependent, but a lot of the ways that um, some of the farming is done in Europe is incredibly deeply labor intensive as well. Um, like olives, for example, you would be shocked at the amount and the level of, you know, it's basically the same level of pruning is going into the olives and then in the harvest it's even more work and if they get bruised it's a different quality so i think while that's a, a very real thing definitely um some of this is just about changing the labor that we are doing rather than adding labor changing what we are doing i think also that has no doubt to do some with the slower adaptation of it um, but I think some of it is also just a mindset. Yeah. Oh, there's so many good questions on there, but 
for it. We can hop back to them. I want to do some live ones. So if you want to have your question answered live, raise your hand. Because I know there's some very passionate people on here. Well, Jonathan went, well, let's see. I think I'll do. All right. Let's. Seems like. Okay. I'm sorry, now we I'm got sorry. all the hands going up. Oh, everybody's going up. Okay. So. <laughs> Should we go with some people that ask questions in the uh, yeah, Q&A already? Yeah, let's go. I'm just going to let Nicholas go first, Hannah go second, and then Jonathan. Uh, I think that'll be good for me. Hey, Nicholas. Let's see. Are you... Can we hear your microphone? Okay. Do you have a microphone? Can you hear me? Yes, hear you fine. Hi, how are you oh, doing? Yeah. Um, oh, thanks yeah. very much for, for this yeah, yeah. really, really interesting presentation and discussion. Discussion is the best part, always. So... <laughs> I just wanted to, to have a um, question on the senescence and you mentioned, and I've heard it before I read about it, uh, that senescence can be communicated amongst plants uh, through mycorrhiza. Do you have any references to some scientific studies? Uh, I'd love to see some of that. Uh, and I, I'm more into understanding the compounds that are actually produced uh, exuded through the roots in order to to communicate this kind of information. I'm just wondering whether we could still, uh, if we understand this mechanism well, whether we could still uh, allow the fruit to, to, to be harvested, well, to be born and harvested, and somehow counteract these messages mm -hmm. so we can have both benefits. So if you have any references, and if you know the compounds, and if we can discuss a bit more on that. Things. Yeah, it's it's such a good question. Um, it's not a part of the topic that I feel super versed in. I've looked for references. I found some stuff out there. Um, it hasn't always left me satisfied. A, a lot of my teachers will refer to a specific compound called glyburic acid, um, which is, I believe, a growth hormone that gets right. excreted in the roots. And I, I'll... I'll there's a couple papers I've seen. I'm going to try to find them and also share them with, with Zach to share afterwards. To me, it feels like a weakness in the methodology that um, I think a, like a lot of new things, things get repeated without, you know, that scientific evidence, which there's multiple ways of knowing and of feeling these things, but it's also nice to have that scientific evidence. It's a good question. I think more work's needed there. That's my opinion. People that are deeper in this field or in Brazil where the research is probably being done in Portuguese might be able to answer that much better than myself. And then I think the question of like, okay, well, if you're trying to get a fruit, but you have to take the fruit off so the plant doesn't enter in senescence, well, then you don't get the fruit. Like, what's the point? I think it's a really selective application. It's like, I'm planting this to get apples, chestnuts, hazelnuts. I'm not going to remove those fruits, but the, maybe the elderberry or the hawthorn or I don't know, grapes, trying to get temperate examples. Maybe those are this there for support or the first few years, I'm going to go ahead and remove the flowers from that plant. And so I, I really think it's being selective based on the design, almost the economic design in a way of the system. And, and that's something you have to consider. I've been in systems where I've wondered, I, I was reviewing some notes from a course and I was like, man, they take off every flower. And I started wondering about pollinators, like right, there's flowers on the edges and stuff in a wild setting. But at, at the same time, it's like, what are the implications of that? There's, you know, there's a reason systems want to go into senescence. They need pause if we're always like, jamming the gas on vegetative growth there's going to be implications of that well as well and so i think these are pieces that we need more study of observation and you're going to change a lot based on climate that i don't have great answers for i think it's a really it's a spot-on question that i i would love to get more information on as well well cool. thanks for your time nicholas Right, we're gonna go over to Hannah. Good to hear from you, Hannah. Hey guys, great. Hey, hey. 
Hey, hey. Um, Zach, Raleigh, great to see you guys. Scott, thank you so much for all the wonderful information. You're um, welcome. Yeah, with Abundant Earth Foundation and then one of our projects, Agroforestry Regenerative Communities, we've supported a lot of centropic agroforestry, especially in East Africa. Uh, and had a, I have two questions. So the first one is about um, Gliracidia and using that as a green manure and for one of the, the tall trees. And then also people have used it then for firewood and, and building materials if needed, but it, especially the green manures, which I don't think you dove into too deeply. So I was just wondering if you're using Glaricidia in Costa Rica as well in your systems and. Yeah. Yeah, we use Glaricidia a lot, especially in the drier parts of the country. Um, there's there's not a, a huge emphasis on legumes in syntropic farming um, that we see in other maybe agricultural or agroforestry methodologies that are very like you have to have that the NFT, the nitrogen fixing tree, like it's got to be Glaricidia, Lucaina, um, Erythrina, etc. What we are most interested in is things that are going to grow fast that are gonna get up high, give a shade, gonna give us a lot of biomass. Um, Glyricidia, one thing I, some of the things I don't like about it, so we're usually really incorporating it with other species is that it, it drops its leaves in the, in the dry season here. So it doesn't give us that shade when we really need the shade. It's quite, um, this deciduous would be the, the term, um, but we do use it and, I think, especially in the tropics, that legumes should be a, a, a deliberate component of these systems. And so some of our earliest placenta two species in particular are going to be things like cowpea, jack bean, um, sun hemp, we use a lot, pigeon pea, et cetera. But we're not that I'm not interested in the nitrogen fixation that's happening, but I'm more interested in the, the quick biomass, the change in microclimate. Um, yeah, that, that's how I think I would answer that question. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I know um, they're really using it a lot in Hawaii as well and on the big island to try to build up the soil. So um, there's, so my there's oh. legumes I like better mm -hmm. um, that we have here different Inga species mm -hmm. um, that we just have found are hardier, get up faster. They might have this certain disadvantages that can only propagate the my seed while Glyricidia we can do by cutting. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of those trade-offs, uh, but there's ones that I like a little bit better than Glyricidia. We do use it though. Okay, cool. Um, so you mentioned briefly the use of eucalyptus. And for many of us, that is our biggest criticism of syntropic agroforestry, especially in Mediterranean climates where we've seen it be so devastating, like in Portugal to the massive wildfires. Um, and in Colombia, we saw it being integrated into syntropic agroforestry. And we're just like, what? Um, I, I, I was wondering if you can say why it is liked and also isn't doesn't it have oils in it that kill the other plants. So I, I just don't really understand why um, Gosh liked it and totes it for syntropic agroforestry. Yeah, um, I don't think it's given any more emphasis than acacias or uh, other fast growing timber species. It's, it's nice because it grows really straight and it's very fast and it coppices really well. Um, it has those advantages and it's a, it's a marketable timber that some of the fast growing natives that we would use here, their timber qualities are, are really minimal. My understanding, I'm not an expert at this, is that we, the, we look at the when eucalyptus has been such a problematic species, it's when it's being planted in these massive monocultures, hectares after hectares after hectares. 
in these centropic systems, it's being planted in these highly diverse agroecosystems. And so I don't think we can think of it the same way. Like we could probably like bananas, boy, I can tell you the banana farms here in Costa Rica are horrendous for the environment, mm. but I'm still going to put bananas in these systems because I can see the difference between scale. Um, eucalyptus, I do believe it is allopathic, um, although I, I don't know that much about it. Um, uh, the, the pathways it might be preventing or um, discouraging other plant growth. Um, there's, there's tons of allopathic species out there. A lot of plants have allopathic tendencies. What that means is that they exude roots. They exude chemicals in their roots that basically discourage other plants from growing. I believe it's mostly from the roots, it's like not so much the leaves falling down and things like that. Okay, I, great. I, again, feel that it's a question of scale. Like, for example, we have a lot of teak here and people are convinced teak causes nothing, like it means nothing will grow underneath. But really what happens is it's a hundred hectares of teak and they have giant leaves and it falls on the ground and nothing wants to grow underneath. It's, mm -hmm. I don't think it's so much of a chemical relationship. So people would probably disagree with, with me there. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's basically just learn from nature and have diversity in your system and check out the scale as long as yeah. you've got the I, going and it works. And I think we would need to look at eucalyptus in its native environment. That's a practice we often talk about in Centropic. It's like, all right, how does it grow in its native environment? Do other things grow around it there? Mm -hmm. Or is it just in a single stand of eucalyptus forest? And I, I think those are the things we would explore. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, Hannah. Hannah Eckberg, Eckberg, everybody. She runs Abundant Earth Foundation, worked with John Rulak. Really cool, really cool person. Okay, so next up, we're gonna, gonna have a thing, Jonathan. Hey, Jonathan. Jonathan Needham. Jonathan, does your microphone work? Hello, can you hey. hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine. Hi, guys. I just want to ask a quick question. First of all, I am so impressed with what you're doing out there in the real world. I wish I were 20 or 30 years younger. Very, very bold and brave. You're at the very frontier. So congratulations on that. Gracias. Uh, I'm fairly new to learning about Centropic. I was introduced to it by Ursula Artsman in Switzerland, mm -hmm. who trained directly with Ernst. And she turned me on to the Life in Century Bee documentary, which I've added to kind of an ongoing uh, progressive farming learning post I have. And I did some more reading, and I just want to ask, it seems like there's an element within Centropic, which is maybe a little more passionate, hardcore, which really is, and I put this in the original question post about an hour ago, uh, is it correct that there's a core of centro Centropic thought where you really want to even cut out all irrigation is an input and rely purely on mother nature or is that more of a fringe is that part of the original tenants you've been talking about rainwater collection and things so just just curious trying to get a handle on the theory versus practice there thank you yeah i i don't know so much from the like direct from the source mr ghosh what i've seen from the folks directly that have studied with him, that have been my teachers, Enrique, um, Fernando Repeo, um, Joao Cito Semenchi, is that they're putting irrigation down when they're in these drier climates. Um, I have mostly seen the move to eliminate the need for compost and things like that. We, we pretty much will put compost down and some sort of rock dust down during installation and that should be everything if we've done a good job i suspect if you're in a really dry climate if you i think if you followed a true accumulation phase like if you took three years and you were just planting things that need no irrigation and they're just getting up there and going to shade everything in the future 
building biomass, organic material, then, then you might be able to avoid any inputs at all. That would be a really important experiment for somebody to do. Um, yeah, those are my thoughts on it. The good question. These are all good questions. Cool. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. All right. One last live question. This is tough. I got to choose between one or the other. I think Marius spoke last time, so we're going to let Leo talk, and then we'll go back to some other questions. Hey, Leo, can, uh, does your microphone work? Might need to unmute your microphone here. Well, maybe we'll get back to you. All right, Marius, you're you're up. Hey, Marius, good to hear from you. Uh, can you hello? Hello, can you hear me? Oh, hello, yeah, you yes. fine. Nice. Um, so my question is: is also what are the minimum? input what we have to give into the macroorganism on the human level so the human can start acting and what is teached by nature and process after that what was the last part of the question mario um what is teached by the nature and process so when the people know how to implement the um the system the five percent of planting um what are the yeah what of the 95 percent do they need to be teached by people or what is happening by nature so yeah what is the seed yeah. we have to give the people cool yeah. that's a that's a fun question um i never thought of it like that i think there's some practical things that people need to learn how to prune maybe your fruit tree in a specific way uh for example or if you're gonna field graph you need to learn how to do that. You probably need to study, take a course, practice, et cetera. So there's always going to be some of those pieces. I think what people would benefit from the most of having, I don't know, a mentor, let's just say, like somebody that could come in and, and give you observational tips. It's just those specific moments of intervention where you're like, I think now is a good time to take the branches off of that tree to open up for the tree underneath. I think it's fairly intuitive. Once you've done this once, taken a course, you've seen a site, it's fairly intuitive. The pieces of this is where I'm going to put the mulch. Uh, this is a problematic weed that I need to remove. This tree, uh, it's not growing very well. It needs a lot more sunlight. So I, I think a lot of those pieces or it's like, hey, that, I don't know, like the cosmos flower that was in the system, it's flower now it says has dried seeds i need to remove this thing those pieces feel pretty straightforward it's more the synchronization of the whole system like it's like hey we need to replant something how do i prune this three meter high young emergent species so that it'll keep growing and grow in a way i want it how aggressive can i be taking off horizontal branches of this high species you know, when is that squash becoming too much? And maybe I've only gotten half the squash harvest, but it's really spreading. It's it's interfering with the site. I, I'm going to remove it from this species or the, the consortium in general. I think that's probably the trickiest part is like knowing exactly how or when to intervene in the specific ways. The, the actions are not that complicated. Um, maybe it gets more tricky as it gets older when you need to go high into a tree and prune especially if you're going to be using a chainsaw people design their system so they don't have to do that with a, a pole saw an extension saw etc but there's nothing beats intuition like nothing beats it okay yeah yeah, and if I can add on to that, I would just to kind of throw another flavor on top of your answer, Scott, I would suggest that all of these things can be learned by nature 100%. When I look at Sepp Holzer and Ernst Gosch, it's amazing the level of overlap 
and there is difference, but not necessarily dissonance. You know, there's so many overlapping things. I think the big thing is the rate at which you can learn these things. You know, you can spend a decade experimenting and getting feedback, or you can go to one workshop with Scott and still learn the things from nature, but just start much further along in that timeline. Similarly with our course, you know, you can learn everything about managing water from water, from nature on the landscape. How long is it going to take you? It might take you 30, 40 years, but can we move you through that process in a six month course instead? Um, so I, I look at it much more as the rate of learning so much rather than can you learn it or not? I think you can learn it all from nature. It's just a matter of how quickly um, and, you know, where do you want to start along that pathway? And do you want some wayfinding to help move a lot more quickly? Or do you like just getting lost and figuring it out? And that's great as well. You know, it's kind of whichever you want to do and how quickly you want to get to your goals and your end results. Yeah. And go out and see these systems, you know, and if you could apprentice, get training, like, you know, do a, an extended workshop, like that will always help. All right. Well, there's some really good questions, Lot. I know we don't want to stay here too long. We're coming up on two hours and it's been a wonderful two hours. And just reminding them, everybody, um, let me ask you if we're going to answer a few more questions, but everyone's going to get the replay. So check your inbox it might be today it might be tomorrow but everyone's getting a very special offer for uh, the water stories core course and uh, along with the the pdc we're going to give you the links for those and some of the resources we talked about so keep watch in your inbox and you'll be able to share share it far and wide all right well i thought this was a good one about labor from brandon it's kind of long but I'll, I'll try to summarize it as good as i can uh, he's saying, hey, awesome presentation, Scott. I had a question about the amount of management involved in a true centropic planning system. This is a big consideration for clients who want to have a food forest system but not be but may not be willing or understand the amount of management needed to make it successful. Can you give some idea around the amount of actual hours involved in the management of a centropic planning system Conver- compared to a more traditional chop and drop? tropical food forest layout. Uh, I see many similarities, but I'm curious about the difference in uh, labor. Yeah, um, I I can relate to Brendan right now. Um, there are times when I do not recommend this methodology to clients. I, I don't think they're up for it. Um, we will take parts of it. We'll recommend simpler things like that. That happens. Um, a quick example I can give, um, there's a row, it is 20 meters long, and it is about two hours a month in management. So 20 meter row, two hours a month. When it's harvest time, there'll be more to manage. Um, we could probably do some calculations from that, but to give you a quick, quick idea, the, the, what, what we're trying to do, what we often see in a traditional, I don't know, food forest here in Costa Rica is like fruit trees and a lot of grass, fruit trees and a lot of grass. And so what happens is a lot of that work is very simple work of a weed trimmer. And we're in these systems we're interested in moving away from that work we're trying to get the work that is like pruning with snips and like pruning saw and it's work that's ideally in the shade which is a big thing working in the tropics you can really you can do so much more in the shade and so part of it is trying to shift the type of work that's happening because often these simpler systems still require labor but it's labor that we can really just kind of externalize to like, in the case of Costa Rica, just a local worker or crew that just weed trims and they come in, they do the weed trimming. All right, everything else is done. It's, it's, there's not that much more to do. Um, I, I think that there, there's part of me that feels these systems are more aligned with scaled systems with a productive 
means because you can really eliminate or reduce so much the inputs, the compost, et cetera. And you might choose it that on a homestead scale that doesn't make sense for you. It's like, no, oh, I'll buy five sacks of compost a year and I don't have to spend so much time pruning five meter tall trees. I, I think these are some of the trade-offs people have to weigh as they sift through different methodologies. Here's a uh, one from Meredith Harper, kind of a brown, you know, kind of about she's in Costa Rica too, wondering about the toxicity of kind of pipes and things. Uh, she's asking, what are your feelings about piping material for moving water around the farm? I'm on a thickly regrown tactol in Costa Rica and we'll be doing rainwater catchment and well water. There's a lot of water in the ground already because of the layers of regrowth. I'm concerned about what I've been reading about plastic pipe degradation and chemical leaching and don't want to bring this into the ecosystem. I don't know if I'm the person who can answer that the best. Um, we have clients that are concerned about it. Here in Costa Rica, your options are a bit limited um, unless you're just like, you can import copper piping. There's a client who decided to do big sprinklers instead of you know drip emitters running through the beds because he just felt that that was gonna be la less water, water in plastic for less time and further away. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know if Zach or Raleigh, either of you can comment on, on plastic and water. I mean, there's where I would really say, you know, we can accomplish the same things over a slightly different time scale while losing a little bit of control without any plastic. And I think that's part of what you guys are doing in integrating water harvesting with Syntropic Ag. I'll also say that it's definitely not necessary everywhere, like on a lot of places yeah. where Syntropic Ag is being implemented. There's flat land and plenty of rainfall, so you don't really need to do. And I think this is also where a lot of times these ideas of not needing irrigation is from, because in certain climates and situations, you absolutely don't need irrigation if you do something like this. In others where you do, can you plant the rain during the rainy season so that you don't even need the plastic pipe? Usually you can with some mix of you know, modified expectations and goals and plant species, and then with addressing the landscape. Um, in the most extreme situations, you might need to do both. You might need to have water harvesting to reduce your irrigation needs and then still have some irrigation just to keep things alive in the 11 month dry season that you have in said climate, for example. So it's, it's always different in different situations. Um, the way I look at it is how do we maximize the cheapest water? You know, rainwater is the cheapest water. Mm -hmm. Then surface runoff is the next cheapest to process. Then surface stored is the next cheapest to process. We get into really expensive water when we're pumping out aquifer water through pumps and pipes and plumbing. So if we can reduce our needs on the expensive water and really enhance our cheap water, a lot of times we can just do away with the plastic altogether or really, really limit how much of it is needed. Um, and then, you know, how extractive our practices are on the aquifer as well. And selecting crops that simply don't need irrigation. And that's, that's completely doable in probably most climates around the world, right? People grow food without irrigation. Absolutely. Yeah. So much of it is just getting over the perception of what we think we should be doing or how we think we should be doing it and letting the landscape guide a little bit more than our preconceived notions. Well, here's a big uh, question about Christos. And I was, I mean, I, I saw you guys nursery and it's kind of a nursery question. Benefits and disadvantages of starting a system and clients by potted plants, seeds and cutting. So how do you really start everything from scratch yeah. are you just buying everything from a large nursery or are you taking the time to start everything yourselves and if i could just add one layer to add in another question people were talking about the expensive prices of sourcing plant materials in north america and in other yeah. places um, and any suggestions you have for that yeah so in a perfect world and the centropic ideal does not exist 
everything started from seed or a cutting. You're letting it root into the ground. Your avocado, you put the seed in the ground and you graft it in the field, uh, you know, 80 centimeters a year later, or two years later. If you're in a context where you have access to like just a ton of plant material, and Brazil is context. It's like you want 500 pineapple pups. It's not that hard to get. Here in Costa Rica, even though we have pineapple industry, it's still not that big. It's kind of a pain in the butt to get that. Um, it's like, well, you're not buying 20,000. No, we're not going to sell you 500. It's like this weird scale. So in an ideal world, you're starting like as much as you can by seed, division, cutting. Realistically, you're probably going to start purchase some plants in bags and pots or start them in your own nursery setup. If you're going to seed things every time, you might seed into a system. You might do it multiple times. You're encouraged to synchronize the system, do that pruning, and then put the seeds in the ground. If you're planting from bag, my understanding is you can really do that whatever time, you know, weather permitting, climate permitting. I think one of the great skill sets, if you want to get into this, you have to learn is, is just how to propagate plants yourself and become a little plant scavenger, a little monster and have clippers on your side at all time. You're driving down the road and you're just like plucking things out of like some random person's hedge. We're constantly encouraging clients to do that. And so learning plant propagation is an important skill set in this. If you're going to scale it up, or you just start starting small. It's like, cool, I'm gonna do one 20 meter line. And in three years, that'll have all the plant material I need for or 80% of plant material for lines two and five. And in two years, I have all the plant material for lines five through 30. And, and you can scale these things up really quickly with plants. There's always gonna be some things you probably just wanna buy. Like here in Costa Rica, I'm gonna always buy already grafted citrus in bags like the reality of finding good rootstock finding good sign material practicing grafting having success having the nursery set up having the timing all work that it works like you need the citrus now and it's already it's a lot to do all that um and so i think being really clear which things you can do yourself which things are really cheap and so many plants that you can get cheap because they're the abundant plants already. These are the things that are already producing in large quantities. They're dripping seeds everywhere. They grow fast. That's already what you want in these systems. So you're, the only expensive exotic things you might be putting in or might want to put in are things that would be your production species, your crop, your avocado, your, I don't know, your chestnut, your cashew. Okay, that's your investment. Everything else should be like almost, it's almost like weedy roadside species that you should be able to get in pretty large quantities. It can be a beast implementation of these though. Like at scale, it's like, oh yeah, a thousand bananas are coming in. <laughs> That's like a tractor trailer of banana ehos or half a tractor trailer probably. Um, it, it, it adds up. Well, and the scaling is so important, like you mentioned. It's one of the things I almost recommend every climate start, or sorry, every client start a mother garden. Right away, you can immediately begin understanding what grows well, what doesn't, what needs a lot of care and maintenance, what doesn't, but it also gives you that plant stock to then propagate from. So many times you, people spend, you know, one to five years just orienting and learning and uh, sure, absolutely, as far as doing big structural changes, you need to take that process, but you can immediately start throwing plants in the ground. And as long as you have just like the slightest level of not going too crazy with really dangerous species that might naturalize and get yeah. out of hand, you're not really going to cause any damage outside of that. Uh, and you can immediately start learning, but then also start building your plant library that then gives you the ability to have these thousands of plants to then plant out into these systems. We're always looking for opportunity or, or organizations that donate trees. Here in Costa Rica, there's a number of like government reforestation programs. And sometimes people are really picky about the trees. I'm like, I'll take anything. Like send them my way. Like, let's see how it does. Let's throw it in there. I'm going to plant them super dense. They think you're like planting them 10 meters apart. I'm like, no, 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 10 centimeters apart. Like it's mm -hmm. a different thing. We don't tell them that. 
And so looking for those type of programs, they exist um, probably wherever you are, um, they exist and, and leveraging those. That was one thing that Grant did. He he was able to get you know, thousands of fruit trees from universities. And I'm, I'm sure he like registered himself as a nonprofit or something in order to universities to get, sell them to him at a really huge discount. Yeah. That was one source that he got him. I, was just, I saw a... Uh, by Byron hopped in here for a second. Byron grows. He's got a really cool channel about agroforestry and centropic ag. Byron, if you're still here and you want to hop in and give some input about your experience doing centropic ag and permaculture. He's, he's coming, Raleigh. He's okay. coming to the permaculture course. Ah, nice. Very cool. Well, yeah, we'll be visiting still, soon. Nice. Sweet. Um one oh, question that kind of touches yeah. on a bunch um, is, Scott, there's a lot of people asking, uh, you know, I'm trying to do this in the States. Are there any maps or resources for people to find the other people doing this in their area? Where would you go to try and find that? Oh, I think we lost your headphones there, but we got uh, Yeah, yeah we got they you. died. I'm back. They, they ran out of battery. Um, yeah. Um, I, I've not seen much in the United States. I mostly see stuff in Europe, but there is a temperate climate centropic Facebook group that I believe is quite active. I should I should make that and I should go in and join that. I'm not very good on Facebook, but um, I would start there. And then I think as you find a farm that's doing something interesting, um, then just ask them what's going on. Is there a group? Try to form a meetup, etc. Um, that's that's what I would look at. Cool. Awesome. All right. I feel like there's one really really good live question, and then we might wrap it up, and we could Zach, if you're cool. We could let uh, Byron talk for a second because that would be fun. Uh, I think the last Q and A question here before we move on to Byron would be uh, Muhammad. It's a question about budgeting. So budgeting for uh, water as a requirement in time and space. Like, how do you guys budget for water? I imagine water and fertility, like when you start, like, cause I know some people when they plant and they're like, these are heavy feeders. These require this much water. Like yeah. what do you guys do for budgeting? Um, well, for fertility, we basically follow a pattern of, oh, I can't remember what it is. It's like, I'm going to make up a number. I, I can find this number, but it's like 200 grams of compost per square meter or something like that. And then like 50 grams of rock dust per square meter. And so we, we follow that pattern. It's fairly standard across centropic industries. What I, I have taken like five or six courses now. I've had the chance to do that over the last five or six years and really see the same pattern apply with the ideas that we're going to tie into the ecological process and succession and, and that initial boost is really just there to get us started. If you're trying to grow veggies in this and like have a market garden component, which some people do do that and I think are really successful, okay, you need to approach soil fertility quite different and you're probably going to have more initial inputs because you're just, you know, you're going to grow cabbage and tomatoes and eggplants. Those things take a lot. What we found for water budgeting has been really hard um, when we've collaborated with agronomists who specialize in that they're like only in this mindset of like well the mango goes every 10 meters and you're giving water to a mango and i don't know what to do about all these things in between these 50 other plants between these mangoes <laughs> every 10 meters and they they really struggle with it we um really the, the agronomist i mentioned javier he took a deep dive into this and we're gonna it, with this blog we're gonna come out with we're gonna look at it and, and we'll share it in the blog, like the actual calculation to see the water demand. And what we found, it was just astronomical using these kind of conventional numbers. Um, it, it threw us off. It was like, well, we, don't, we can't even come close to applying that much water. Our approach has been like just really focusing on plants and organic material and mulching and trying to minimize the amount of water needed in these systems, knowing that, you know, maybe those avocados would produce year three if we were able to irrigate really well, but we're only going to get them in year four. 
for me, this speaks to the reality that for most parts of the world, these systems are still experimental. Like, I think in Brazil, there's enough data that comes out hidden away in Portuguese and in this giant, wild, diverse, huge country that people could speak more fluently to, to these type of questions. But I think it's so site specific and we don't have enough information yet. And we're working in you know half the country where we work in, we don't need to irrigate at all. So we don't even touch upon irrigation, uh, thank goodness. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't, I don't have a good answer for it. Nice. Yeah, I think also see. just to add something there, it's you know, there's huge variability in the amount of water that is needed versus is desirable, and you can be amazed by the very limited amount of water that plants can survive off of, and in fact giving them their desired water on a regular schedule hugely inhibits their root growing potential and their potential to not need water in the future. Um, so that's something I, we always try and steer people away from regular irrigation because it makes a bunch of baby plants that can't survive well on their own. Um, and at the end of the day, you don't want weak plants. You want strong plants. And so it's it's easy to like focus in on a number and be, think I need this much water, but you need as much water as the plant tells you it needs to survive and pushing it to that stress where it becomes water stressed triggers growth responses to search for more water. So if you never let the plants get there, they actually don't reach their full potential. Beautifully said. Well, hey, Byron, great to have you you join us. I've been following a lot of your videos on, on Citropic Ag and agroforestry. It's really cool following you because you went down there to visit Ernst Goetsch's farm and you you learned there for quite a while, didn't you? I was only there at his place for one day, which huh. obviously you could spend time with him and just keep gaining information. It was a really valuable day, though. I spent We spent the day managing his forest together and basically I was just absorbing everything I could. But that was the purpose of the trip last year to Brazil for two months was basically just visit as many sites as I could and just gain as much hands-on practical experience as possible to kind of complement the learning that I'd already done in the following years or previous years here in New Zealand, um, where Syntropic Ag is not quite as developed. It's a bit more of a new idea. And so just seeing what the other world leaders are doing in Brazil was super massive. And again, that's my reason for going to Costa Rica and then back to Brazil later this year. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, how, when, I mean, like, I've, I've really enjoyed... productive and cool conversations. Sorry. Oh, no worries. All right, so you're in, you're in New Zealand right now. I, I love New Zealand. Got to learn from Kay Baxter. That's where I did my PDC. Um, what area are you in right now? Like, where? Yeah, I'm currently at the bottom of the North Island. I don't live down okay. here, but I'm doing some traveling. So this is the Wanganui River. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of like, I know it's kind of a more colder climate, subtropical, like what what places have you seen as, as close as possible to a syntropic system in New Zealand? Well, they definitely exist. So there's more and more happening every single year. Um, mm -hmm. The oldest one, is up in Northland and that's about 16 or 17 years old. And they were the first kind of family to bring Centropic Ag to New Zealand. But only in the last, I believe like five years, did they kind of start being public about it and start sharing. So there's the one system that's like 17 years old, they're called Permadynamics. And then every other system after that is like five, maybe four. Most of them are like less than three years old though. Yeah, such a beautiful, I mean, there's so, permaculture is such, so alive and well across New Zealand and their systems that are are just mind blowing everywhere. I love, I love being there. Such a wonderful place to learn. And yeah. Fruit road trip. New... Let's go rally. What's that? Time to go? Okay. No, we should, no, we should go on a road trip to New Zealand. Oh yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be sweet. And uh, Byron, you're going to be teaching alongside Scott at the, the PDC or the Strop Guide College? Awesome. I'll be. Yes, sounds like I might have a couple things to say here and there, but a lot of it I want to just learn and see how, see how Scott and you guys do it. Sweet. 
Well, thanks for popping on here. It's, it's good. Good seeing you join. Yeah, sounds like it was an awesome conversation. Nice. Well, everybody, we're coming up. Oh, what a session. Almost three and a half hours. Had yeah. a wonderful, wonderful time with everybody. I think at the peak, we had around 200 people live, almost 600 people signed up. So it's great having all these people interested in Zootropic Ag and the, the local folks showing up from Costa Rica, from, from Central America. It's really awesome having you guys here because I know it's like, we're all in this place, we're dealing with water issues and we want a better way to, to grow food and restore ecosystems. And Centropic Agriculture is a beautiful model and what Scott, Sam, Povenir Design has done, it's it's inspiring. And I that's one really bright light I, I see here. Um, and if you guys have anything else there, uh, Zach, Scott, do you have anything you guys wanna share before we close it out or? So we Scott, just, you want to give uh, us some last last final thoughts to wrap it up? You've, yeah, done an amazing job, shared so much information here. I know people are going to take this home into their gardens and start working with it. Uh, you have any final message to leave folks with? Yeah, I can trust your intuition. I come back to it all the time. These things are new. I would be down in Brazil talking to somebody and realize that what they're doing is an experiment. You know, you can see what we post on social media or YouTube video, and we don't have the whole picture. Before figuring this out, we'll be figuring it out for generations, probably. Um, I, I'm infinitely intrigued by the possibility of a true zero input, full process based agriculture. And, and I, you know, we had so many good questions that I don't have the answers to. The same questions I have, the doubts. I'm, I'm going to, I'm a, a skeptic by nature and so like we need people desperately exploring these uh, on a research level on a field level on a backyard level on a farm scale level and um, i think you have to trust your intuition all of it there, there's nothing stronger than that yeah zach raleigh thank you guys so much uh yeah real pleasure seeing you both again pleasure having you man thank all you right. scott awesome to bring you on 10 years later we're all still uh, together yeah no, oh, 10 cool. year reunion. <laughs> beautiful uh, well, most famous chicos, and thanks for everyone who joined us from Europe and the Northern Hemisphere and India and Kenya and Africa. It's it's so awesome. This is a, a global community here. It's so cool.